Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening uh, for our uh, latest installment of the History Speaker Series. I have some amazing people on screen here with me who I will introduce to you. But before I do, I have a couple thank yous. Uh, firstly, to Deanne, who is our partner over at Rogers TV, uh, where they have been airing these talks after the facts, and they're a great partner for us to have. We're very lucky. Thank you to Marianne Grant and the OMA History Committee, without whom this event would not be possible. Thanks to Monica, who you're seeing on screen, uh, for making the beautiful posters that you've been seeing as we advertise. So uh, here on screen, I can introduce to you Monica, of course, uh, who is um, uh, the operations coordinator at the Aurelia Museum of Art and History. No doubt many of you will have interacted with her already. I have Trish Crogrand as well, who is the head of that OMA history committee that I mentioned. My name is Lindsay. I'm the history programming coordinator at OMA. And then, of course, I have our fantastic speaker who I now get to introduce. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Sylvie Brown, who is uh, the daughter of longtime OMA members and supporters, Kennifer and Bob Brown and the granddaughter of tonight's topic, uh, renowned sculptor Elizabeth Wynne Wood. Um, tonight's talk is uh, the story of Sylvie's grandmother, and it's also related to two works that were recently acquired by OMA for the permanent collection. Now, we had had some, uh, some dresses and whatnot um, that were donated to OMA, but these are actually the first two of Elizabeth Winwood's artworks that are included in our collection. So uh, we're just over the moon to have them as part of our, uh, our collection at the museum. And it's fairly fitting that uh, we get to hear the story of an amazing female sculptor from Aurelia who uh, made such an impact in her field. Uh, uh, shortly after March 8th marked International Women's Day. So, um, Sylvie, thank you so much for being online with us this evening. We're so thrilled to have you and to hear your, your conversation about your grandmother. So, without further ado, take it away. Thank you very much, Lindsay. I would like to begin by giving credit for all the help that I had in creating this talk. You're hearing my voice but this presentation draws on many sources of information. Ah, I should be sharing my screen. Ah, good. Share. Okay, everybody can see? First of all, most of my knowledge comes from the 56 years that I was privileged to hear stories from my mother, Jennifer Brown, who was the only child of Elizabeth Winwood and Emmanuel Hahn. As a little kid, she canoed with her parents. Here she is out camping in the Georgian Bay area. And as a five-year-old, she was sculpted with her teddy bear in this formal portrait by her mother. I have also had the benefit of insights from each of my sisters who have their own experiences of growing up with our grandparents' art. Jennifer, up in the left-hand corner, once said that we had all inherited designer genes, which we express in our own lives. In the middle are my sisters, and I will introduce them from left to right. Sydney is an architect. I am an archeologist and mapping technologist. Nigama studied art history in Toronto, Montreal, and Paris. Sybil's business career has always included strong patronage of the arts. And Aurora had a small business painting her own compositions before her career as an actress took off. Our father, Bob Brown, and you can see him up on the right as well as in the middle of the photograph, never met Emmanuel Hahn but he had vivid recollections of the first time he was introduced to Elizabeth, where he soon realized that Kennifer came from a family of very talkative thinkers. He was always supportive of Kennifer's work on behalf of her parents 
and when she could not attend the opening of the Han Wood exhibit in 1997, he stepped up with a keynote address about Elizabeth as a teacher. I have learned so much from the catalog written by Victoria Baker in 1997 for the National Gallery of Canada's touring retrospective of Han and Wood. It was the result of five, six years of painstaking research. And Kennifer was very grateful for Victoria's friendship and curatorial skill. Finally, I have benefited from all of those institutions and private researchers who've put their work on the internet for me to find whenever I Google my grandparents and their circle. You may remember seeing this Hall of Fame banner in, in 2017 when Aurelia was celebrating its sesquicentennial. Or you have perhaps visited the Aurelia Library where you can see this beautiful marble bust of Elizabeth Winwood sculpted by her husband. Also on display are Elizabeth's large bronze busts of Stephen Leacock and Charles Harold Hale. And if you went to Aurelia Collegiate, you may remember her portrait bust of Premier Leslie Frost. Perhaps you have sat in Victoria Park in front of the leaping deer in its new granite setting. Or as members of OMA, you probably saw these exhibits in 2015 and 2017, both curated by Kennifer. To me, this sculptor, Elizabeth Winwood, was my granny who I knew as a little girl. This photograph was taken by my father at her home in York Mills Valley in 1963, when I was two years old. Here, Elizabeth in the center back is talking with her sister Elmo, while my mother, sitting in, in the middle, holds her newborn baby, my sister Sydney, and chats with her sister-in-law, my Aunt Jan, who's holding the camera. And meanwhile, my grandmother Brown, from my other side of the family, keeps me from wandering off. This photograph was taken on the occasion of our christening in Toronto at the same church where my parents had been married. Betty Wood was the youngest daughter of a family who ran a dry goods store on Mississauga Street. She was born at their cottage on Cedar Island, which they called the Wood Box, and grew up in the big house on West Street, which they called Westward Ho. She spent as much time on the lake as Aurelians do today, learning to swim and canoe. As a child, she was given plasticine to play with, and she decided very soon that she wanted to be not just an artist, but a sculptor. In 1921, Betty, whom you can see on the left-hand side, um, in the middle of her, she's at the front of this group of friends, enrolled in the Ontario College of Art, newly established at their Grange uh, campus in Toronto. Here, her teachers included group of seven members, Arthur Lismer and J.E.H. MacDonald. So in this portrait on the right-hand side, uh, from the left is, um, is MacDonald, and then third from the left is Lismer, and second from the right is A.Y. Jackson all of them members of the group of seven. The curriculum included a lot of drawing, painting, and graphic arts. Two landscape that landscapes that Betty painted as summer assignments already show her awareness of light and mass, trees, landforms, and clouds. Even her historical painting of the flight into Egypt has many landscape elements. The tree and the night sky catch your eye as much as the figures of Mary and Joseph and their baby. The dark colors and the position of the figures with their backs to the viewer express how much this young family was traveling far from home in a strange land. Betty's most important classes were in modeling and casting, taught by Emmanuel Hahn, who was on the right-hand side of the portrait in the last slide, and here is on the right-hand side of this class photograph. Emmanuel was immediately impressed by the fact that she was the first woman he had ever met who always carried a sharp knife. 
Emmanuel Hahn had his own love for the Canadian wilderness, especially the Georgian Bay area, which he had been exploring for years with his brothers and sisters. In 1908, he bought an island in the Pickerel River near the French, the historic French River canoe route. Here he hosted his sisters, his students, and other artists and friends. In these two photographs, we see his students, Carl Schaefer, Lowry Warner, John, and John Byers, and also his sister, Anna Hahn. Many of them painted and drew their own views of the island. For example, in the upper left-hand corner, we see a pen and ink sketch by his sister, Rosemary Hahn, um, made from the south end of the island as, as, she, as she sees it from the water. Carl Schaefer, his student and later a painter and teacher himself, created a woodcut-like drawing of one of the little cabins on Monty Hans Island. Lowry Warner, another student and one of Canada's first abstract painters, depicted the same cabin at night with bats flitting about catching mosquitoes. And friends such as Paris Gava Clark uh, painted this view of the south end of the island in one of her few landscapes. By 1925, Mani and Betty were secretly engaged, as you can tell by these very intimate sketches that they made of each other. And after her postgraduate year at Ontario College of Art, they were married very quietly on, in September of 1926, and they spent their honeymoon on the island. Here's a small photograph of that time. And my parents spent, spent their own honeymoon there in 1960. That fall, she took further graduate courses at the Art Students League of New York. When she returned to Toronto to establish herself as a professional artist and teacher, she was now known as Elizabeth Wynne Wood. Basically, she slimmed down her middle name and used it to enhance her last name of Wood. With her first finished works, such as this man and woman, she made it clear that she was a modernist. Elizabeth's stated ambition as a sculptor was to create monuments. In 1915, when she was still in high school, her hometown had commissioned a monument to Samuel de Champlain and the 300th anniversary of his exploration of the Aurelia area. They, they asked the same sculptor, Vernon March, who later designed the National War Memorial in Ottawa to create this grouping. After the Great War, communities all over Canada began to erect memorials, many of them reproductions of original work by Emmanuel Hahn, who designed for the Thompson Monument Company, as well as teaching. On the left, we see Tommy in his greatcoat in Lindsay, Ontario. In the middle is Grieving Soldier, one copy of which was erected in Fort William in 1921, and my family growing up there did not know that until the late 80s. And then on the, le the right hand side is the Memorial to the Lost Boys of Malvern Collegiate in Toronto. Canada held an international competition to choose the design for its great memorial at Vimy Ridge in France. We can see in the small photograph some of the several entries, Emmanuel Hahn produce one of them, uh, but the, the design was awarded to, the commission was awarded to Walter Allward from whom, with whom um, Emmanuel had worked as a younger sculptor in the teens. On the uh, lower left-hand side, we see uh, the sculpting of some of the figures and the big view shows us the finished monument in, um, in France today. Larger Canadian cities also sponsored monument design competitions of their own. And in, and in Winnipeg, this resulted in great controversy. In 1925, the prize winning design on the left caused a national uproar when it turned out to be the work of the German born Hahn. When the competition was reopened in 1927, 
the committee was delighted by the work of a young woman born in Canada, shown in the middle, until they found out that in private life, she was Mrs. Hahn. Eventually, they settled for a very undistinguished, non-figurative third place winner by a local man who had been born in Britain. Despite the bad publicity from this inauspicious start to her career, Elizabeth produced many highly regarded works in the late 1920s and early 1930s. So much so that in 1934, she was invited to enter the competition for the Welland Crowland Monument. Her winning design was described as the last great World War I monument in Canada. It was unveiled the day after the opening shots of World War II. It is unique in depicting both a male soldier, man the defender, and a female figure, woman the giver, who represents the service of those on the home front who supported the soldiers overseas. Elizabeth con continued this commemoration of partnership when she, asked, when she was asked by the Niagara Parks Commission to design a monument to John Graves Simcoe. She persuaded the commissioners that it should include a the figure of his wife, Elizabeth Willem Simcoe. And so the monument is dedicated to both, both of them. 12-year-old Kennifer posed in her galoshes when her mother needed a model for Simcoe in his riding boots. In 1955, Elizabeth won the competition to sculpt Canada's official mo monument to King George VI, which, like the Simcoe Monument, is found in the Niagara area. And she was commissioned to create Canada's tribute medallion to John F. Kennedy after his assassination. If you look very closely at that medal, you can see that under his neck are the initials EWW. Although figurative work was important throughout Elizabeth's career, right from the beginning, she became well known for her smaller landscape sculpture. Like the group of seven, she wanted to express the essence of Canada in a modern idiom, but she was unique in doing this in three dimensions. She also chose to finish these works in the medals of the Canadian shield rather than the more traditional bronze. Northern Ireland of 1927, was meant to be displayed on a base of black marble or glass to represent the water flowing around a small island hosting a single windswept tree. Even without such a base, the form of the sculpture suggests the water out of which the glaciated rock arises. In 2003, the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame worked with Kennifer to adapt a miniature version of no Northern Ireland as the award for their inductees. And here we see the band Rush when they were inducted into the hall in 2010 with their award. Reef and Rainbow, first finished in plaster in 1927, was Elizabeth's seventh work to be cast in tin. Tin has been prized since antiquity as the ingredient that hardens copper into bronze, but it is extremely rare. In 1935, when the casting was, when the tin casting was first exhibited, the sixth form boys of Upper Canada College were asked to look at it and write essays in critique. Elizabeth took the time to respond to their work seriously, as she herself was a teacher, and these boys were the future captains of industry who would be the, the future patrons of art in Canada. She wrote that she was able to make this innovation of casting in pure tin because today we mine large quantities of tin in Canada. It is one of our most valuable natural resources and is a beautiful material for our plastic expression. Like gold, it will not tarnish on exposure to ordinary air. With this sculpture, she depicts not only the solid rock, but the ephemeral clouds of an afternoon in late summer and even the refracted light forming the arc of the rainbow. Passing Rain of 1929 was an island bas relief here rendered in marble at the request of the National Gallery of Canada. Again, she included weather elements in the form of slanting rain that implies the strength of the wind blowing the clouds across Georgian Bay. 
With Dead Tree and Rock of 1929, she returned to sculpture in the round, this time also modeling the water swirling past the tree clinging to the rock. This work was cast in aluminum. Finally, in 1930, she stylized all of these elements of sky, water, rock, and tree into her relief called Dead Tree. A cast of this large medallion was erected by the York Mills Valley Association as their centennial project in 1967. Hahn and Wood also adapted this design for printing as their Christmas cards for several years. And on the right-hand side, we can see an example of that little card that she sent to her sister Elmo in 1930. Even when Elizabeth was focused on figurative work, she often included landscape elements in the sculpture. The Welland Monument includes pine bushes and sheaves of wheat to represent the land being defended by the trench mortar. For a memorial to Louise Booth, an art historian and longtime librarian in Toronto, she modeled a young pine growing from the roots of an old stump. And here we can see her distinctive signature on this plaster. Probably the most well-known, but ironically uncredited example of Wood's landscape sculpture is found in the 1935 design of the Voyager Silver Dollar. Hahn, an accomplished medalist, had been commissioned by the federal government to design the first coin to be minted in Canada. He was asked to use the motif of a French Canadian fur trader and a First Nations guide paddling together in a birch bark canoe. He consulted historic paintings for the canoe and costuming, and he used his student Carl Schaefer as his model for both figures. For the background and setting, he turned to, to Elizabeth, who suggested the island tree and aurora borealis, which do so much to unite the whole composition. She lent him her sketches and models for his reference. Upon her marriage, Elizabeth was quickly drawn into the world of annual canoe and camping trips north of Toronto. Often these were taken in the company of other artists. And as we see in this photograph from the island, there are many people out camping in um, next to one of the little huts. They're sheltered underneath a uh, awning because it gets pretty warm there in the middle of the summer on those rocks. And on the right hand side, we see Elizabeth in her white shirt, leaning over and possibly sketching. Every summer from 1926 to 1939, except for 1937 when my mother was born, Elizabeth and Emmanuel paddled to the island in the Pickerel, out to Georgian Bay, and sometimes east to Mazinaw Lake, north of the St. Lawrence River. Everywhere she went, she sketched the landscape as painted by her friend, Will Ogilvie, in the smaller drawing on the, in the left corner. And Ogilvie was later a war artist for Canada in World War II. As expressed by my sister, Sydney, the sketches that Elizabeth made during these summer canoe trips were her lab for exploring the form of rocks, trees, water, and weather. Over these years, she was developing her own graphic language for how to represent these elements. Summer after summer, she came back to the land because it was worth exploring and looking at and depicting. Elizabeth was not just imitating the style of the group of seven painters, although the shapes in her work appear similar to theirs. She sought to develop her own style of representation that would be true to the land, and this is exactly what these landscape features look like. She had been trained to produce fine illustrations for a career in graphic arts, which was actually how many of the group of seven painters supported themselves most of their working lives. At first, her sketches were studies of individual rocks and trees made in small notebooks. But very soon, she began to draw complete landscape the black and white equivalent of finished paintings. These were made using a few simple portable materials, a pad of 12 by 18 woven rag paper and black litho crayon, 
an oilier medium that is less apt to smear than charcoal. Not only could she sharpen the point to draw fine outlines, but she often used the whole length of the crayon to suggest planes and masses. This drawing technique totally engaged her hands and eyes and was good preparation for modeling the same forms back in her studio. Elizabeth knew that her drawings had value in their own right. And especially during the depression, alongside her sculpture, she entered them into annual exhibitions and sales. She also submitted them for publication, as in this drawing printed in the Canadian Forum magazine in 1932. Curators have also come to value her landscape sketches as outstanding Canadian art. Both the National Gallery of Canada and the Art Gallery of Ontario have several of them in their collections. The McMichael Gallery's recent survey of female artists in the early modern era, uh, the installation of which has just opened in Ottawa at the National Gallery, features many of her sketches. They are not often displayed because they are delicate. And last summer, Aurelia Museum of Art and History displayed this newly acquired Elizabeth Winwood drawing entitled First Trip Honey Harbor as one of the 50 objects that helped to define Aurelia. Throughout her career, Elizabeth Winwood built up a remarkable and beautiful body of work that stands alongside her sculpture. The family of Elizabeth Winwood looks forward to more collaboration with the Aurelia Museum of Art and History to help make these drawings better known alongside her sculpture. Thank you. And at this point, I would like to share a different screen and just allow the, the many slides that I've shown to click through. And you can just look at them um, on autopilot as uh, we move to the next part of the program. Perfect. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Sylvie. Okay, let me find that. Uh, that. Yep, go for it. So while you do that, um, uh, many of you will know already, but um, the way we run this here is that if you have any questions for Sylvie, please put them in the Q&A, which you will see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You may have to move your mouse to make that bar appear. Um, so yeah, if you just click on that, you can type your questions in and we'll pose them aloud to Sylvie. Um, we do have a couple of comments here as well, thanking you for your presentation. Um, I see we have Hamid Julia joining us from Baltimore. Uh, oh, from Julia. So yeah, so amazing to see your grandmother's amazing work is what it says. Um, and yeah, it really is exceptional. We're so lucky here in Aurelia that we can count some incredible artists um, across many, many genres, music, uh, visual arts, and so many more. But she is certainly one of the, uh, one of the most exceptional. Um, I'd just like to say that um, Julia is here at my invitation. She is, uh, she is like my mother in that both of her parents were famous photographers. So she is, she's had a similar life journey of, of um, helping to curate and uh, make known. Well, her parents, her parents' work was quite well known, but um, being, being their daughter was, is a special burden that my mother understood. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you for joining us, Julia. Um, we have a comment as well from Randy who says, thank you and great talk. Um, so Sylvie, I have a question for you yes. um, and I'll, I'll just pose it to you so that I can give folks a chance to uh, warm up their typing fingers for questions. So um, as I mentioned at the top, um, International Women's Day just passed. And obviously Elizabeth Winwood is an exceptional woman and an exceptional sculptress. So can you talk a little bit about her influence um, that she had on female sculptors? Because she's really, she is sculpting at a time when not a lot of women are sculpting. Is that right? Can you talk more about that? Um, 
she was she the thing that was was uh, special about her was that she was uh, a professional sculptor. Uh, it was very interesting to me uh, just the other day looking at photographs of um, the class of 1922 from um, Ontario College of Art to see how many of the students, like most of them, were um, female. And I know that um, in the late 19th and early 20th century, it was um, not unheard of by any means for women to take up sculpting in the same way that they might take up um, painting or other, other kinds of fine arts. Uh, but Elizabeth uh, was somewhat unique, and uh, sorry, I'm using a adverb or a, a, an adjective for a word that should not have uh, any modifiers. She was unusual in that she made a full-time career out of it. She strove hard to set herself apart from her husband by always using her maiden name. And um, she was a full-time teacher as, or a part-time teacher as well. And uh, she was addressed always as Miss Wood. It was only in private that she was known as Mrs. Hahn. It was not easy for her to um, have that job as a teacher at a time when people felt that a woman who had a husband who already had a job should not be taking employment away from a man who had a, might have a family to support. But um, so many letters of recommendation were sent to the Toronto School Board saying that she was absolutely the one that they should hire for this job, that they in fact hired her and she taught there for 29 years. She was teaching for two and a half days a week and then the rest of the time she was very busy working on all of her various commissions. Okay. Um, okay, so we have a, actually quite a few questions coming in. So prepare yourself, Sylvie. Okay. Uh, the first one uh, from Janet. How many drawings in all did Ms. Wood Hahn do? Um, over 100. We don't know of all of them. Um, my, my sisters and I are still discovering things um, as we go through my parents' house. Wow. Yeah. Um, so a question here from Dawn. Elizabeth worked tin and aluminum, you mentioned. Given Sudbury, did she ever work in nickel? Not that I know of. Um, she, one of the things that she did do during her, her postgraduate year at OCA before she was married was uh, work on learning how to cast tin. Um, um, she was... She was probably uh, very familiar with nickel, but I, I'm not myself as sure how well it would have worked for. She perhaps experimented with it and didn't find it be as useful. Whereas tin, she found to be very easy to cast and very the results were absolutely beautiful. I'll say. Um, a question here from Beverly. Where did Elizabeth teach? She taught at Central Technical School in downtown Toronto, and it was um, it's it the the alumni of that school are very proud of all the things that they've learned there, the many famous people that have come out of that school. It wasn't just a collegiate institute of of academic learning, funneling people off to university, uh, but it there was a lot of hands-on instruction, and her work was in teaching modeling and also art history. Okay. So it was almost the, the high school equivalent of taking classes at uh, on the Ontario College of Art. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> this is a great question here from Deanne. Can you talk about the process of creating monuments? I picture your grandmother with a chisel climbing over large pieces of granite. <laughs> Well, um, she did have some experience in carving, but there are basically two ways to sculpt something. You either take a solid block of material such as wood or, or stone, and you cut away the parts that you don't want to create the finished piece. Or you build up the positive by modeling it. Uh, you have a, you might create a frame, and then you uh, model clay on top of that. And then when you have your finished clay, 
you make your own model, your own cat um, mold, and cast it in uh, cast, make a finished cast in plaster. That's still an intermediate stage, and especially in the case of a monument, very rarely does the sculptor work at the finished huge size of the finished piece. Uh, for instance, when Emmanuel Hahn was sculpting the Adam Beck Memorial, uh, which is now on University Avenue in downtown Toronto, that, that um, sculpture is 13 or 14 feet high. He started out making a, what's called a maquette, a uh, small thing about, uh, probably about 20 inches high. And then once he won the commission, he sculpted it again in quarter size, and then half size. And then um, he, and in, in each of those cases, he sculpted it in clay and then made a mold to make a bronze, or a, sorry, a um, plaster casting. And then his last plaster casting uh, was then used to make the final mold for the um, bronze casting. And that work is, is usually done in a foundry. And if it's if the final work is to be finished in um, stone, such as granite or marble, that is almost always done by somebody who specializes in that carving work. And that person has to be as well trained as as the uh, sculptor designer because that is very fine work. Um, my grandmother worked most of her life with Louis Temporali, who was another student of my grandfather's. And um, my, grand, my father, um, early in his married life, once went to Temporali's um, facility with his mother-in-law when um, she was having some pieces, some final pieces carved by him. And um, she described the, the final details that she needed. And he worked away and he, and my dad said that it was, it was as if two minds were both attached to the same pair of hands. So um, this, this, the casting and the carving uh, in the case of my grandmother was almost always done by somebody else, but it was somebody that she worked with as closely as possible. Okay. Um, and I guess just to go a step further to clarify, the molds that were used, would those be just a one-time use? Would they be destroyed in, in making the sculpture? Or could you use those over again? Well, that, that process itself uh, has quite a few steps to it. Okay. And um, the, the, the foundry will make um, an official mold. And then what they'll do is they will using the uh, process called the la lost wax process, they will use that mold to cast um, a version of it in wax. And then, and then the wax is used, um, which has to be checked by the sculptor again. The wax is then used to um, uh, create an investment block, a block around it. And um, the molten metal is poured into um, the block that's built up around the wax. And, as, and the wax is immediately melted and those hollow spaces are then filled with the bronze. So um, in addition to making the, um, the process involves making a lot of little channels for that wax to spread away. And then once you break out the finished metal piece from the casting block, you then have to carefully um, grind off those screws and gates as they are called. Okay. So that process itself also requires a lot of technical training and finesse and working closely with the sculptor. I had no idea how involved it was. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions here. Um, so one is from Barb, which says it's clear that Elizabeth Winwood was a feminist before her time. What do you think influenced her to find the strength in her life and her work? She had a very supportive family. Um, she was, her mother uh, was the one who found the house in Aurelia that um, she grew up in. 
she she had met the previous owners at a party and she told them if you ever sell that house I would like to buy it and it was actually her name Sarah Elizabeth Weaver Wood that was on the deed similarly the business their dry goods business in downtown Aurelia on Mississauga Street was uh, actually incorporated in her name and um it was run by her husband, but when he died in 1915, she continued to run the business into the 30s until the depression just closed down the market. And she was um, always busy going to Toronto to buy wholesale things for the store. As far as uh, Elizabeth's training, um, as a little girl, she was sick a lot. and She spent a lot of time in bed. So her mother gave her the plasticine as a toy that would occupy her while she was in bed. And she also gave her lots of books on um, ancient classical art. So that was what um, influenced, it was those gifts from her mother that influenced her to want to become a sculptor. And she had to work to support herself with scholarships to actually, as far as I know, there was never any discouragement by her her mother and her and her family is very proud of her work. Wow. Um, another uh, question in a similar vein here comes from Rosemary, um, who says, I've been curious about Elizabeth, but never came across uh, information on her. How wonderful to hear more about the person behind the art. Just last month, I bumped into a sculpture of hers at the National Gallery in Ottawa. Did you find it difficult at all as a woman and how widely known was her work? During her lifetime, she was quite famous. Um, she, she burst on the scene with all these very well-reviewed small sculptures that I showed you this evening. And um, the National Gallery, um, um, when they saw, for instance, Passing Rain, they commissioned the, the final marble carving of it. And, and purchased it. Um, she, she was very outspoken as a teacher. She was used to talking and she did lots of writing. Um, I was gonna say. So she, she, she was invited to be, um, she was the first woman who was invited to uh, hang the annual art show at the um, Art Gallery of Ontario in 1930, I believe it was. Um, so she was she she and her husband socialized with all the other artists of the of the day in in Toronto, and um, she she learned very quickly how to um, how to enter competitions, how to um, promote her own work and um, she did good work and it was noticed. Okay. And I hope that when you saw this work at the National Gallery, you didn't literally bump into it. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad that you noticed it. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, then we actually have a question here from William. Um, when did she move to Aurelia? She she was actually born in Aurelia. Um, Cedar Island was still considered part of the city. Her parents bought the big house on West Street when she was a, a little kid, so that's where she grew up. She went to school boarding. She went to boarding school in Toronto for most of her education, but she was always back on weekends and during the summer. And um, as an adult, the the, the family home on West Street in Aurelia was always a gathering place uh, where other artists came when, when everybody was on their way up to uh, the Pickerel River. It was the place you'd drive up to and then you'd catch the train from up there. So Aurelia was always a base of operations. And um, in fact, she's buried in the cemetery across the street from Harris on Coburn Street. Or Cold Water Road, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Did you hear many stories um, of her experiences in Aurelia? Places she liked to spend time? No. Um, she died when I was 
um, when I was four. And um, I do have a couple of memories of her, of interacting directly with her. I remember the sound of her voice. It, mm -hmm. was, it was a low, deep voice. Um, and I remember hugging her once, but I did not, I did not have, I was not able to hear a lot of stories directly from her. And um, I don't have a lot of uh, things from my mother about specific places in Aurelia, but there are family photographs of her canoeing and boating with friends on Lake Kuchiching. Okay. Um, uh, are you still doing okay for some more questions? Okay, yeah, I told you there were several. <laughs> um, so uh, one here from Deanne says, uh, what was life like for your mom growing up? Did she ever feel pressure to follow in those artistic footsteps? No, she didn't feel pressured by any means. Um, she was absolutely encouraged in her own, in her own uh taking after she, um, her parents were very intrigued by the drawings that she made. There was one time when my grandfather was having a professional photographer come in to photograph some of his and Elizabeth's work. And there was a drawing that my mother had made when she was in her mermaid phase, which was about six years old, um, that he was, he was so impressed with this that he had that photographer photograph that as well. <laughs> and I, and the reason I know this was because I was looking through the um, City of Toronto archives for images of my grandparents' work and came across this thing that she had drawn. Um, and we've since found many of her notebooks that they preserve. I meant to have it with me and I forgot to do it, but um, one time while um, Emmanuel was cast, doing some small casting in his own studio, um, my mother had modeled a small mermaid and he took that and he cast it in the same metal that he was doing his own work in. Um, as I mentioned, she, she was in and out of their studios all the time and she modeled for my grandmother at one point. And, um, when she expressed an interest in studying architecture rather than other kinds of fine arts, um, they were, they were fine with that. And she started out at University of Toronto and later, later she transferred to University of Manitoba where she and my dad met. Hmm. Um, okay, I have a two part question here from Janet, uh, in regards to the sculpture that is on the poster for the talk for tonight. Yes. Um, the first part is, can you tell me anything about the man who modeled for the stunning sculpture? And where is that sculpture now? Uh, that man's name was Narcisse Peltier. And um, he was a fellow student at the Ontario College of Art. Uh, he was a painter and um, several of his small works are in the McMichael Gallery. And um, he later went on to become a professional photographer. And he was, he was very close friends with both Monty and Betty. He went up to the island with them and took one of the photographs that I showed this evening. And um, she in turn made this monumental bust of him and I believe that that work was um, something she made for her for her own pleasure rather than because it was commissioned mm. and that that finished plaster is in the art gallery of Ontario although I'm not sure if it's currently on display um okay uh, a question from Beverly where were the studios that they worked in for a long time they were on Adelaide Street East Adelaide Street in Toronto. Um, they each had their own studio. Um, the house in York Mills Valley, they had been saving for that for years and it took a long time to get it built and then it took even longer to finally build a studio uh, next to it, uh, which was necessary because in the early 60s, the building that they had been in for decades was torn down. Interestingly enough, my sister Sydney's architecture office is just down the street from the site where that building used to be. Very cool. Um, actually, a comment here from Sybil. Um, mm -hmm. 
it says uh, Elizabeth with others founded the Sculptors Society of Canada. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. And, yes. Um, and then a question here, and I think I'm I'm gonna have this be the last question. Um, and it's in regards to oh sorry, it comes from Randy. And it says, Sylvie, I'm curious about the blue nose dime. Did Elizabeth Winwood have anything to do with that commission? No, she did not to, to answer the question. But because of the success of the Voyager Silver Dollar, um, and because Canada now had its own mint, um, a competition was then opened for designs um, for the rest of Canada's coins. Elizabeth did make entries into that competition, as did many other artists. Um, but Emmanuel's um, choice of the the uh, blue nose was chosen for the dime, and um, the caribou, which he had originally proposed for the for the five cent piece, was chosen for the quarter. And to go back to my sister Sybil's earlier comment about um, Elizabeth's advocacy of art by helping to form the Sculptor Society of Canada. A large part of the second half of her career was spent advocating for the arts in Canada, especially um, sculpture, but not not solely sculpture. She eventually uh, went to UNESCO as one of Canada's representations when um, that part of the United Nations devoted to cultural affairs was being um, started and then she was instrumental in founding what later became the Canada Council on the Arts. So she was always writing and advocating for the the rights of artists and the um, the, the appreciation of the arts in Canada as a vital part of, of society. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Sybil, as well. Um, so, oh, and she's added a little bit more. I'll just read yes. it if that's okay. Later in life, Elizabeth bought an old house in Craighurst, which was her studio that was later sold to a potter after her death. It was a studio for many years. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh. Um, yes, there was there was a point after her husband died when she was thinking, oh, maybe it's time to get out of Toronto. And she had she had bought this little schoolhouse that was not far away. It's not that far away from uh, Aurelia, with the intention of making it into her studio. But by that time, she was ill again, and uh, so she never used it. Yes, uh, I see that comment. Yes, that was Woodside pot- Pottery. Yes, that's cool. Um, okay, so um, I think we're going to wrap things up there. Um, a lot of a lot of comments as well. Uh, Sylvie just saying thank you for the talk. Um, Renee actually says thank you for this wonder of wonderful event, um, and asks if the talk will be available for future reference. Yes, it will be available on the OMA YouTube channel. Um, uh, well, I mean Monica usually has it up there fairly quickly, so um, yeah. It will be available. I'm just going to hop in there, sorry, and say uh, that to everyone registered, I send the link out usually on the Friday, um, pending any uh, technical difficulties that I might experience. Perfect. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Yeah, so uh, Sylvie, thank you. It's been a pleasure to have you with us this evening. Um, and to hear stories about your your own grandmother, who was such an amazing Aurelian. So thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about her. I always enjoy being able to do that. And I always learn new things every time, even though <laughs> I think I've seen all the pictures that I can find on the internet. There's always something new to find. So thank you very much. And in fact, I see in the chat that the city of Aurelia is possibly going to name a street after her and that's that is also a new fact for me so thank you for telling me about that yeah I saw that one come in as well uh from Susan so thank you Susan um so uh, I am going to turn it over to Trish now um who's going to wrap things up for us so thanks very much everybody okay 
Great, thank you very much. Um, um, first of all, I wanna say a very special thank you to Sylvie for being our guest speaker tonight and sharing with us the story of your grandmother, Elizabeth Winwood. She was a renowned sculptor, advocate of art education in Canada and our really a Hall of Fame recipient, which we are all very proud of. She has such an incredible life and legacy and thank you for sharing that with us today with your personal memories. Um, a very big thank you to all of you in attendance tonight and for your ongoing support. Uh, since we transitioned to the Zoom format for our series, it's been a, um, a format um, supported by many of our viewers, and we've been able to reach out to more households, not only in, in our wonderful community, but throughout Canada, and in some cases, the U.S. and further abroad. It's a very exciting for us to be able to share our local history with so many of you. And remember, as Lindsay mentioned and Monica did, that these presentations do become available on the OMA YouTube state, uh, site, as well as through Rogers Channel 10, it goes into rotation. So a great opportunity to re-watch re re any of these series or suggest to your friends and family. So as you can see from the posters, we have a couple more talks coming your way. In April on the 19th, we have Judy Humphreys of the Gravenhurst Archives returning again, this time to share the story and visual journey of the Ontario Fire College founded in 1958. Then on May, 7th, on May 17th, um, as our sites start to Head towards the summer season. Our guest speaker is Michael Hill, the artistic director of the Mariposa Folk Festival, who will present the 60 Years of Mariposa, which is just in time before the festival returns this summer. Uh, Michael Rill recrowned the past 60 years of the festival's musical and financial up and downs and provide insight into the interesting people involved in staging one of Canada's, Canada's iconic cultural events, which was founded here in Aurelia back in 1961. So some great talks coming your way. Be sure to register and we look forward to seeing you back in April. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, and have a great night. We'll Bye see guys. you next month. <laughs>